Hello, I'm Jonathan Backrack, and I'm going to uh, conduct this uh, hands-on boot camp for Chisel. And just want to tell you what we're hoping to achieve. We want to get you started with Chisel, really get you um, trying it out. We'd hope by the end that you get a basic working knowledge of Chisel and learn the, the, the philosophy of, of Chisel and how to solve problems within it. Um, we're not going to be able to cover everything today, so we want to make sure by the end you know where to get more information. Now, we're, we're doing this boot camp through uh, EC2, and you've all been given um, uh, login information. So, um, so hopefully you all have Wi-Fi. Does anyone not have Wi-Fi access at this point? Okay. And, uh, and then... Um, you've been given a machine number, which corresponds to this XXX. So try to log in at this point. I'm going to give you a, a minute to do that. Okay, for those coming in right now, we're, we're logging into our accounts on EC2 that you've been given through the Air Bears Wi-Fi access. Um, and this is the uh, machine, or the username and the password. Anyone had luck so far? Okay, great. Okay. Anyone having trouble? Okay. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, anyone need more time? Okay. All right, so... Uh, one strategy that you might want to use is um, if you happen to get disconnected, one good uh, way to pr um, save your work is use screen. So you can use screen um, and, use, uh, and then start up a bash script. And then if, when you log back in, you can use screen-r to come back where you were. Okay. Um, okay, so first thing we're going to do is um, we're going to CD to chisel-tutorial. So that should be on the top level of the, um, in your directory structure. And then do git pull to bring the latest, the very latest as of a um, few minutes ago or something like that. <laughs> Anyone having luck with that? Okay. All right, so what, what you're going to see once that's done, um, or even right now, actually, uh, is within that structure, there's, there's a make file at the top level, and then it's divided into three sections. There's examples that are chisel examples that I'm going to go over um, that are fully worked out, have a test harness with them and everything, and you can play with them later. Um, and then there's two more directories, problems and solutions. So problems are going to be problems that I'm going to give you so you can get your feet wet with chisel. And then there's a corresponding set of solutions so that you can see how we solve those problems. So we're going to leave blanks in the problems. 
and they're going to fail the, the tests, um, and you'll know you, you've solved the problem when, when you pass all the tests. Okay. Everyone um, got the latest Chisel tutorial? Okay. Anyone not? Okay. Okay. Okay, so now one more thing. This is what I'm going through right now. Some people like to have that on their own machine, and I edited that all the way up to like a few minutes ago. So if you guys want to go to this website and get the PDF file corresponding to this boot camp, you, you can, and, and then you can jump around and, and use in, in an order other than what I'm going to do. Um, Okay, so it's basically uh, at the top level, the Chisel website with bootcamp dash today's date in uh, the good date ordering. <laughs> okay. And that's also available. Sebastian, that's available. This is available as part of the downloads. Yeah, part of the downloads. If you go to the top of the chisel directory, you'll okay and okay. All right. So what is chisel? Um, it is a hardware construction language, um, and so you write your designs in chisel. They um, they produce a, a a graph corresponding to the hardware, a data structure in Scala. And then from there, you can go to Fast C++ for fast simulations. You can go to Verilog for FPGAs or ASICs. Um, but it, you're describing how to construct the hardware. It's not compiling Scala to Verilog. Okay? Um, instead, you're writing a program to construct the hardware. And by um, it, it adopts best practices from hardware and software design. Um, and we chose to embed it in a high-level language to leverage all the mindshare um, and the good design ideas there. Um, it um, allows you, with a single source, to produce um, outputs without changing the, the, the code. Um, there's, for example, um, abstractions for memory that get handled in a target-specific manner. So what is Scala? Scala is a modern language. It compiles to the JVM. It's got good performance. It interrupts, operates really well with Java for that reason. Um, it, it combines the best ideas of object-oriented and functional programming in a really nice blend. Um, so it has a lot of these modern software engineering ideas. Um, it also has support for adding domain-specific languages. It was designed with that in mind, so it makes it easy to add something like Chisel to it. And it's pretty popular. Um, many universities are using it for research projects, and uh, some um, companies are using it for deploying um, their, their uh, infrastructure. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour Scala. I can't possibly show you everything in Scala, but I'm going to give you the rudiments. Okay, so the first thing you need to know is how to create bindings or variables. So you can either create constants with val and then with a name and an initialization. And here I can define two at a time using this tuple. Or I can do a variable, and that means, um, so this can't be redefined, I can't reassign it, whereas variables I can assign to it subsequently over and over again, change the, vari the, the value. And then Scala has a nice set of collections. Um, it has arrays, um, so you can create an array of integers. The square brackets tells you the type that you're going to make. You're going to have 256 elements in it, and then you can assign to it. And instead of square brackets for the indexing um, on the left or right side, it uses parentheses. And then you can find the length. Okay. 
Now this is for a fixed length array. Now if you want to extend, change the length, add elements to it, then you use array buffers. Um, we use this mutable array buffer. So you have to put this at the beginning of your program that uses it. And then you can create an array buffer and you can start out with no elements and you can add elements to it with this plus equals. So it'll just, that'll, after this, that Z will be 12 and L will be 1. Okay, and then finally there's lists um, which allow you to, um, there are like Lisp lists and, and you can um, build them up with the elements you want um, straight away. Um, you can do the same for array actually, like this. Give, it, it constructs it with all the elements. You can also build it this way where you have um, x, y, y, or x, y, z, whatever, and you have to add nil at the end, so it's going to be the values, it'll be, it would be the same as x, y, y, I guess in this case. Um, you can also get the elements out of it, extract the elements by using this notation on the left-hand side. Um, you can get the values a, b, c, assuming l's is a list of three elements. And then this, again, will be the length, which is three. Okay, so once you have an array, um, you can iterate through all the elements. Um, you can either go through, um, you can iterate uh, in an integer through the indices, if I get zero until the length. And so, for example, I could initialize the table um, with the indices. Um, and I also iterate just straight over all the elements without indices at all if I don't need that index for other reasons. Okay, so now I'm here, this one I'm copying an array into an array buffer and adding each element in. Okay, and then functions. You use def uh, with the name of the function followed by the parameters and you just give out the parameters um, with their types. So it's parameter name, colon, type, and then use equal for um, for the actual, what the, the body of the function is. In this case, it's just an expression. When you need more statements, you need curly braces. If it's just a simple expression, you don't need curly braces. It can just be a one-liner. And then, um, the last, last expression will be the value returned by the function. Any questions so far? Okay, this is really quick. It's pretty, pretty intuitive. Um, okay, and then, so here's just um, some of the things you can do because it's got functional programming support. Um, again, you can write, write a, a simple function and multiply the, the argument by two. Um, you can also, you can map, you can create a result where you multiply each element of a list by two using map. So you, this is the result, you, x2 list, you get, so you multiply by two, this one, you get that out. So that's, it applies this function to each element, it creates a new list with, as a result. Um, Okay, and then here's a binary function that takes two, arg two arguments, x and y, and you can actually, you can fold or sum all the elements using this fold, thing. it's like reduce, like map reduce in Google. This is the reduction, and so it'll repeatedly apply this binary operation until all the numbers are summed. Okay, and then Next, we have object-oriented ideas in, in Scala. So we have, we can define a class like blimp and give it a parameter, the radius of the blimp. Um, and then the constructor is listed in the curly, in, in this body here. You can, you can put both fields, which are val or var at, at, in this, constructor, and then there's, um, you can put other code in there that gets executed top to bottom. To construct a blimp, 
you just use new, new blimp, and you give it the argument, and it'll construct, it'll give you a blimp. Um, it'll be an instance of this class. You can subclass um, classes. So, for example, we're doing a Zeppelin here, um, and okay, this should be an H here. Um, we're going to say we're going to have an extra argument that's going to be whether it has hydrogen or not. Um, and when we we're going to subclass blimp, it's Zeppelin is going to be a blimp. And then we have to pass along the argument that blimp requires and thread that through. Okay, and then we can do new Zep here. And then there's this concept of singleton objects, which is a way to organize your, your top-level methods. Um, in this case, I've got this um, singleton object that is companion to the class, blimp. And so I can define, for example, a constructor for blimps that counts the number of blimps constructed. But I can also put other methods up here that are blimp-related. Um, and th those would be like Java class methods at the top level. Okay. But you can see that when you call blimp, so yeah, like num blimps will be available uh, from blimp, the, the companion object. So it's like a namespace for these functions and, and variables. Um, but this blimp here is, is actually calling this apply method is the thing that gets called, is the method that gets called when you just use the name, the companion object name. So that's like a constructor, okay? So, so you can do factory constructors with that. Okay, that's it for uh, Scala right now. So are there any questions from anybody? Yeah. Quick question. Uh, the last number of that PDF that you gave the earlier slide was bootcamp 2013. Uh, 0930, today's date. Thanks. All, all one date string dot PDF. Okay. Okay, so what's next? Whirlwind tour through through Chisel. Okay, so I'm going to give you a really quick overview of Chisel so you can just whet your appetite on that, kind of get an idea of what we're doing. Okay, so what we're going to have is what Chisel allows you to do is with these um, simple expressions in Scala allows you to build pieces of hardware, pieces of graph that represent the hardware. Okay, so for example, if I write out this expression, it's going to wire together this piece of hardware. Okay. And I can then organize that piece of hardware within a module. So I can create an interface that has X and Y as inputs and Z as an output. And then I can wire the output in terms of the inputs using that expression. Okay, so, and you can see that this is a class and it extends module. So that's how I arrange for uh, building a module in Chisel. I can then construct multiple of those same modules and wire them together to build uh, a max um, four that has four inputs and does max over all of them using these binary max modules. Okay, so I just um, wire to get the inputs are A, B, and C, D. I just wire them all up, and then I feed the um, output of M1 to M3 and the output of M2 to M3. So I use this this wiring um, operation. Colon equal. Yeah. Can we uh, nail this one home right now? Why is there an equal and colon equal here? What is the difference? Okay. Um, right now, what? Okay, so colon equal. What it does is it it assigns the input of a node that you've constructed to whatever you're giving it on on the uh, the right hand side. Okay. So that's saying 
the input of x is z. Whereas this is just a placeholder for it. It's not constructing a node. I'm just labeling it like you do in a programming language. Okay, so it's giving a name to something, m1. It's like a module. Um, so that's the difference. I got slides on it, and I think I want to talk to you um, separately um, about that. But that's, that's the basic idea. The equal is really a Scala thing for naming something, um, whereas colon equals is assigning the input of a node. Okay. Yeah. Is colon equal JSON only? Yeah. It's something that we've added. And I, so I'm, I'm actually just doing a real whirlwind tour here so you can kind of get an idea of everything you can do. So then you can arrange that expression, give a name to it, um, and, and, and make it something that you can um, construct uh, as a function. So max2. And then now I can create a, a parameterized max n where I can give a parameter that has how many inputs and, and what, what the width is of each input and, and build that up and use reduction to actually um, put together the circuit. So this is like a scripting of the generation of the hardware all within a module. So we're creating a vector of these, these nodes that's parameterized by n and width w. Okay, that's a whirlwind tour. Just to kind of give you an idea how um, Chisel is a hardware construction language. It's embedded in Scala and uses the full power of Scala to allow you to construct hardware. Now we're going to start from a simple example. I'm just going to break that down. So this is a simple GCD example. And we're going to have the interface is X. Um, you're going to have uh, A and B coming in. It should be A and B. And we're going to have produce Z. And valid signal. And we're, we're wiring those up as a function of the inputs. We're first, we're starting by introducing two registers. Okay. And we're initializing the inputs coming in. And then we're, we're doing this conditional state update, and then we're wiring the output in terms of, of that, of those register values, okay? So this is a simple circuit, and you can see all within a class definition, we can build a GCD. We start by defining the interface to the GCD, and then the rest of the, of the definition is, is the construction, basically building all the state elements and all the wires that we need, and finally wiring the output in terms of, of those. Okay, so now let's um, let's get let's get uh, you, you guys uh, trying out stuff. So go into examples and and type make gcd dot out. Now what it should do is it should load up Chisel, and then once it's done with that, the make file will will build GCD, um, and uh, we'll build a C++ simulation of GCD, and then run a test suite that will will make sure that the circuit um, satisfies the test. Is it working for people? Okay. Yeah, okay. 
All right. Okay, now um, next thing to do is, is try to do um, make gcd.v and we're going to make some Verilog from gcd. And then once you've, you've finished that, you can look at the gcd.v file. We should have editors there that you can, should have um, like Vim and Emacs there so that you can try these out. Um, or look at look at the Verilog, and you can kind of see um, a stylized Verilog that's produced from Chisel. All Seeing Verilog yet? Okay. Anyone see Verilog? Okay. If we just run make in that directory, what happens? It'll build every single example, and it'll take a while. Okay, I'm going to go on here and uh, I'm going to talk about um, a running example full adder, which is a common single bit adder with carry in, carry out, the usual one that you see in digital logic. And in this case, we are building um, up the graph on the right bit by bit from the inputs all the way to the output. And right. okay. And I just want you to note that there's nowhere here in these intermediate um, circuits do I have any, any notion of, of the width. That's automatically inferred. Um, 
And if you look at the Verilog that's produced, you can see that it correctly inferred the width um, to be one bit on all the intermediate um, wires. And if you change the width of the inputs, then Chisel will automatically infer again the correct width of the intermediate wires. So Chisel does width inference for you. So it unclutters your code um, and, and it makes it a lot more succinct. Okay, so now I'm going to um, introduce the next, here's showing you combinational logic. I'm going to show you the next important element, which is state elements, registers, in this case. Um, so registers are, um, are, are uh, updated um, every clock cycle um, after the combinational logic is, is computed. And the simplest version of that is you can, you can construct a reg, make a register that will be updated every clock cycle with this value y. So if you say next equal, it'll update it with that input value. Sometimes you don't know exactly how you want to update or that it's more complicated to specify. So you can actually just give it the type that you want, which is uint um, as the argument. And then you can write a bunch of rules for how you update it. And in Chisel, we use this set of if, then else. We use when, dot else when, and dot otherwise. The bodies of those can have these, can specify these conditional updates on the registers. So here's a whole series of rules for how to update X um, based on, on how these rules will fire. And it, it corresponds roughly to the way you think about uh, things in, in traditional programming languages with if then else. So let's show a bigger example, a shift register. So say, say you want to have um, four registers in a row that are arranged in, as a shift register coming in from in and, and producing its value on out. So we're going to make a hardware uh, module called shift register. And this is how we would define it. So we would very simply just be able to wire all the registers in cascade like this by, by naming all the intermediate results and, re and using them along the way to, to, to wire it all up. And then finally, the last register's value we wire up to the output. And this is the, the Verilog that is produced from that. Any questions about this? Yeah. On your register, you do have a, a reset, but it's not clear where the reset is being used. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that in a second. So also, the other question was for design for tests. Sometimes you'd like to be able to put in scan. So is there a way to set up rules for those? Uh, Scan, yeah. Do you know? It's kind of the, we handle that in the ATPG or PLSI flow things to do that just regularly. If you don't do it, that's at the design level. It's done in, we do that in the back end. Post process. Okay. Scans handled in post processing. Okay. So, yeah, the next example is, is um, um, I'm going to get to the reset question in a second. But say that we add another input that says when we want to do the shifting. Then, we would, instead of wiring it all together uh, in, in one go, we want to instead have a rule for how we're going to wire it together. And the default for registers is if there's no update that qualifies, then they just hold, the registers hold on to their previous value. Uh, but in the case where you have shift true as its input, then you do um, the shifting operation and you just wire all the registers up to each other in this way, in this cascade manner. Uh, so that's, that's using this conditional update. 
Um, and then here's the reset. So if, if you want to give an initial value at reset, then you use this init operation. Um, and so I'm just adding this bit to the, the conditional update example or version of, of uh, shift register. You can also, there is, there is a reset, um, implicit reset that you can also use in rules. So you can just say reset, when reset. Okay. Now, you need some way to specify literal values. And in Chisel, the way we do it is we have the type name followed by the, the value of, of that type. In this case, we're using, I'm showing you uint. And we have a variety of ways that are common ways to specify unsigned integers in um, various formats, hexadecimal, octal, binary, and just decimal. You can also specify, this one infers the width automatically to say how many bits it needs to actually um, represent that number. And then you can, al you can also, if you want to specify exactly how many, width, how many bits you want, you can do that as well. Um, like down, down here. So the second argument is the width. Okay. So I'm going to set you on it a problem here to write accumulator.scala. Um, so now the problems are in um, this directory here of chisel U2. So you're in examples. You have to get in, go up one and down into problems. Um, make sure accumulator.scala is in there. So and edit that. File, accumulator.scala. Are people finding accumulator.scala in problems? Okay. So now what I want you to do is put in the definition here to do the accumulation of the ends coming in. It's a pretty simple task. I just want to get started. So now I've got it so that the output is wired to zero. You want to go in there and and do it so it does accumulation. And then what you can do is you can say um, make accumulator.out. Um, you can do it straight away and then it'll, it'll fail. And then you want to define it correctly in terms of in terms of you know you have to have some kind of state element and you have to have an update rule. So there's, there's a few ways to solve it, but it, it should be really simple. And I just wanted to get you trying something out and uh, getting your feet wet on, on the chisel um, tool and the workflow. It's a little tiny discrepancy. One thing says count the incoming trues, and the other one says sum the ends slightly different semantically. For example, if n wasn't of width 1, that would be different. Yeah, let's assume it's of length 1. Um, so, in fact, just as a hint, you could probably do it all as one line. No, let's see. No, you can't do it all as one line, sorry. You have to, okay. See, anyone, first person to <laughs> solve it, we'll, uh, we'll start giving hints, more hints. Hi, I have a question about um, initializing or uh, defining the width of my state variable. I, can I pull it from, how do I get the property that's the width of the out? I yeah, want my so register to be the you same can, width as... You can as do it like this. You, you specify the width here. So the zero, you I, specify. Yeah, but I want to say, can I say out dot width? I want, I want the, oh. the, the accumulator width to be the same as the output width. How do I pull that property off? Oh, yeah, of? yeah. You say, um, 
io.out.getWidth. Thank you. Thank you. You actually don't have to. Anybody having any luck? Okay. No, question, okay. Thank you. I was trying to say something like when io dot n equals one, or double equals one, and um, I'm getting error. Triple equals. Triple equals. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna just give a little hint. Um, you could just define a register. Uh, initialize the zero, length eight, um, u int zero comma eight, and then just basically uh, at top level just say uh, that accumulator is uh, assigned itself plus one or plus int dot io dot n, um, and then this one would just be um, accumulator. Yeah. That in three equals one. Um, yeah, you have to, all, all literals have to be u in, or you have to wrap u in around the literal. Okay. 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 Let me. So yeah, if you want to do when um, io dot n, then you say u int of zero, uh, one, like that. Okay. So you can either use the conditional update or you can just update it every every st uh, cycle. Um, just saying IO, um, saying accumulator is equal accumulator plus um, IO dot N. Um, anyone have any luck? Okay. Any questions? So, um, um, so mine compiled, but now it says um, for some of these tests it says success, 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 failure, failure. Something about the um, expected one inputs. Doesn't see how many it got though. Hui, can you look at his? <laughs> okay. Yep. Presumably, this would work if you had a wider uh, in also. Yeah. So the oh, no, it'll, it'll work if you have the width of n as it is. Right, I mean, but, but I could have something where in oh, you could have, yeah, you could have a wider two yeah. or four or yes, something, right? Definitely. And something like yeah. this would compile. And so my question is, if I just say plus, how do I know like what kind of adder it compiles to? Um, well, it's going to be the max of the the two. Um, 
elements that it's adding. The width. Yeah, but yeah. Is, is there a way to control whether it does carry look ahead kind of adders or is it just the simple adders? It's going to do, it's going to produce Verilog. So Verilog is going to, um, whatever Verilog ends up doing. If you want to be more precise, then you'd have to uh, build that yourself by hand. Yeah. But currently, like it, it just compiles into Verilog edition. So it just does the cascading edition. Hold Yeah, you can define your own adder, but but this the plus in Chisel compiles to Verilog plus. Okay. Anyone able to get it working? Okay. All right, great. Okay, so uh, you can look at the solutions, and uh, and we can and you can ask more questions. I think I may uh, move on, um, and uh, and we'll you'll you'll keep learning more as we go. Okay, so so I want to introduce uh, conditional reassignment for wires. So say you want to make an ALU um, that has A and B as input and, and, uh, and an opcode that's going to do some operation on A and B based on the opcode and produce that output. So, so we, this is a wire output, um, and we can, if we want to conditionally assign it based on the opcode, we can give it, we have to give it a default value, but then we can use the same when, else when, otherwise to assign it a value. So this is also showing you a bunch of the basic operations that are allowed for uints. And here, here's a complete list. Um, it it's corresponds pretty nearly to what you can do in, um, in Verilog. There's a few more that actually aren't shown. Um, there's a f there's some comparison operations that produce bools. Um, this should be un here. And then just to complete out the operations you can do. Um, you can extract out the bits, uh, some subset of the bits um, from, um, so x to y, x being the high bit down to the low bit, uh, inclusive. And then you can extract a single bit um, by giving it this index here. Um, and then, so here's an example of using that. Um, and it's doing a byte selector where you have um, a word coming in and you want a byte going out and you specify the byte offset. Um, and so you do a bunch of rules that look at the offset and then assign the output based, based on, on that, um, getting the bits using a uh, a bit string off um, extraction. And finally, there's concatenating bits using cat. Um, so if you want to make a bus of A and B, you can use cat. And uh, and if you want to replicate a bit string multiple times, you can use fill. Okay, so how are people doing? Um, anyone? Uh, have any questions about Accumulate before we go on? Okay. Okay, so I wanted to... Um, so I think... Um, so this is uh, another problem that LFSR 16... Um, <coughs> So you should be able to do this. This is a problem I want you guys to try. Um, 
And this is essentially what's going on. Um, and you can do it, do it all. So basically what it's doing is it's XORing the 0, 2nd, 3rd, and 5th bit. Um, and then that's, that's the new 15th bit. And then it's shifting everything over by 1. Um, and so you can solve all that with, um, you have to create a reg to, to hold on to that, that running state. And then you can use cat, extract, and XOR. Um, and I start with the register being 1. And then you update this, do this operation when ink is true. Yeah, but but you can actually use cat to do that. Okay, so um, so you're gonna you're gonna basically from the previous this is your, this is the register that you're gonna have, um, and you're gonna extract out these four bits, XOR them all together to produce. Um, the, 15, the new 15th bit. So this whole thing is going to be shifted over by 1. So you're going to take the previous 15 to 1 um, and, and make that now be 14 to 0. And the 15th bit is now going to be this XOR. So I'm going to go back and review. Um, this is how you extract bits. So you can use a constant here, like 0, for the 0th bit. And then you're going to want to create um, a register. Uh, to hold that LFSR value. And you're going to want to initialize it to 1. Um, it's going to be 16 bits wide. What if, is, yeah. What does ink do? Is it an input to this thing? That, that's, when that's true, you, you do this update. Okay. Yeah. And this is the XOR operation uh, up for the caret. So then finally there's cat, which you could do to build the new, the final operation on building the new value, which is shifting, taking 15 to 1 and moving it down to 14 to 0 and having the top bit be this um, circuit. So back when I was doing accumulator, one of my errors was that I didn't declare the, the width of the accumulator properly. And then when I bound it to the output port, which was width 8, I didn't get any kind of diagnostic from uh, the tool that said you're binding a 1-bit wide thing to an 8-bit wide thing. So it 
was more reminiscent of Verilog than VHDL, if you will. Um, is there a, a paranoid mode that you can run it that will flag those kinds of uh, width mismatches? Ah, so that was actually a surprise. I thought it might forward and back propagate widths so that when it saw the output had to be 8 bits wide, my accumulator, which didn't have a width declaration, would have to be inferred to be 8 bits wide, but it didn't seem to do that. At least my, um, my test passes failed when I, when I did that. Uh, so you're saying um, the, test, the test failed, right? Because that's probably what happened was it inferred it to be 1 bit wide. It goes with the minimum possible width, which is the max of all your input. And so yours, because you were summing it with a one-bit wire, so it's probably just assumed that it would be one-bit wide. Well, so let's go slowly. The the port declaration at the top said that the output had to be eight bits wide. It's true that the accumulator was adding a one-bit thing to an unsized thing that is then later bound to an eight-bit thing, and uh, the forward and back propagation of those constraints didn't inferred that the width of the adder had to be 8, and it didn't generate a diagnostic. So I, I understand where the 1 was inferred, but, so, but that was the, the surprise, was, was that later when that was bound to an 8-bit wide thing, I guess, I don't know, I'm not sure what, what happened there. I guess it padded it with, with zeros or something. So yeah, it, it padded with zeros, but then you can, um, do, you can turn on one of the flags, which is minus, minus WIO, and that says that you have a 1-bit uh, register connected to an 8-bit output. That would any other questions? So on the LSFR, on the LSFR, are you implying, or you'll be using the implied reset to sort of kick it off? Uh, we're going to use uh, initialization. The, the, yeah, the reset value one to be one. Yeah. So. So that'll reset the entire register. Yeah. Okay. So it'll start out at reset to be value one. Anyone having any luck? Okay. Okay. So we're going to have more time during the breaks, and um, there'll be we'll have um, we'll uh, give you personalized help. Um, just ask us. Um, we're going to go on and try to do a little bit more for the break. Okay. So there is width inference, um, and there are a set of rules. And I'm just showing you one: the high-low multiplier, where you have two inputs A and B, and it will produce a, 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 a result um, when you multiply them together. Um, and it'll produce a 32-bit result. And so we're, we're then going to take chop off the two pieces and provide them as outputs. But you can see that, that uh, chisel infers malt to be 32 bits. And in fact, here are the rules that we came up with, um, which um, are essentially, I guess, multiplication uh, adds the widths of the two x and y inputs um, but with, uh, right, OK. okay. This is, should be min, um, but this is basically just keeping the width the same. That's that's what we use, right? That the, um, for for most of them. Um, okay. So there is width inference, and there's a set of rules for how it's done. And. Uh, We've, we've shown uses of bool, but we haven't really talked about it. Um, there is a bool type. Um, it's produced when you do comparison operations. And then when requires um, its condition to be a, a Boolean. You can introduce um, Boolean literals like this. Um, okay, And then 
because when it requires a bool, there's a there's a cast operation to bool. So you have a uint, a one bit uint, you can do to bool. Um, but on the other hand, uh, a bool is a uint, um, and here's the picture. So if this is the type hierarchy, we have we have bits for our scalars, and then we have uint and, and s signed it, integer. Um, but below uint, unsigned integer, we have bool. It's the one bit version. So all bools can be fed into uint operations, but not the other way around. You have to use two bool. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about signed in integers, but they have very much the same operations with slightly different semantics um, than uh, unsigned integers. Just the, the natural sort of thing to do the, to um, properly compute the two's complement result and infer the width. Okay. I'm going to do a little bit more, then we'll do a break. Um, so we've been defining these modules with bundles, um, but I haven't really talked about it. There is, you can do first class bundles. We've been doing anonymous bundles. We can do name bundles by defining a class that inherits from bundle. And then the fields are the elements of the bundle. And, and within that, we can specify the types and initialize them as we've been doing before. Um, but you can create these bundles using new, and you can get the elements using uh, object uh, dot access, field access. Now, when we've been defining modules, we've been using um, actually uh, these wires within the bundle that, are, that have direction, and they're called ports. Um, and so, for example, I'm showing a decoupled um, I.O. Uh, bundle, and it, I'm showing all, all the directions. You can specify all the directions as well on that. Um, and then just to show that you can change the direction, um, you, can, you can actually assign the direction using these um, methods. And I, I haven't shown here, but you can do flip as well to uh, change the gender and all the on all the um, recursively on on all the the elements in a bundle. And so so here's instantiating a, a module. So so say that we want to do a four bit adder, we can build that out of one bit adders, um, and we just essentially build out each of the full adder modules. And notice that when you do new the you construct the module, a child module, you have to wrap it in this module um, constructor. And I uh, just have to do that everywhere. And then finally, you just wire it all up with the colon equal. That's just assigning the inputs of these wires to the right hand side. And bit by bit, we can just add together, um, we can wire it all up. And notice that. The interface is always in this field called I.O. Um, in this case, we're using just an anonymous bundle here, no name. And uh, we, um, but it's always with assign, uh, it's always located in I.O. OK. Question? Yeah. Second last line of code, why do you have the two unit cast on that cat call? I don't think you need that, actually. Yeah, I think that's redone it. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to introduce you back, and then we'll go on a break. So, so I showed how to do records. Um, they're called bundles in Chisel. And arrays are called vec in, um, in Chisel. So that is, we can construct the number of elements of a particular type. Um, and here's two uh, ways of, of constructing them. Either you can specify the type and a number of elements, or actually give it 
the elements directly. And so for here's an example. So say I want to have 10 5-bit uints. So what I have to do is I say vec.fill, say how many, and then within curly braces I give the type I want. Um, you can also create a vec of registers, like so. And then you can write to the elements just by accessing them with constants. And you can also do this with uh, addresses. On the, you can read them or write to them with assignment. Okay. Is this supposed to be a colon equal, or I was I think I was expecting equal. That's equal. Okay. That's equal. Sorry. This too. Yeah. Thanks. I think I'm getting. I'm gonna it. like go through. Yeah. I don't. I'm messing with your head. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No. It's a Scala definition. Um, 